Um, I'm now going to uh, ask our second speaker to come to the stage, uh, Professor Bashka Tungchak. Please come up. Professor, you are the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Toxics Use Reduction Institute. Uh, from 2014 to 2020, you were the UN Special Representative on Human Rights and Toxics. And you've looked in particular in that role on the rights of vulnerable groups uh, and chemicals. Very warm welcome to you. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Thank you Robert. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation to be here today. Thank you to Robert for the warm welcome. Uh, thank you, Leo, uh, for making my life a little bit more difficult and easier at the same time. <laughs> uh, always wonderful to be with you. Um, so I wanted to speak a little bit today uh, about what I've called the, the toxic divide. For, for many years, um, we've heard of something known as the digital divide, where communities have not had access to technologies that were and continue to be increasingly uh, a basic necessity in the modern world. But today, many communities are living in another divide, this toxic divide, where standards of living do not comport to any reasonable notion or definition of human dignity, or equality as we would come to know it today. Part of this notion has come to me through the work I was doing with the UN, where I was traveling to communities around the world and listening to their stories. Uh, this was some of the, the best experiences I had and some of the most troubling experiences I had, was listening to communities that felt that they were trapped with no choice but to endure what they were bearing. Un unquestionably, some of the biggest impacts are being felt today in low and middle income countries. But when we look at the toxic divide, what we can see is that it's also present uh, in surprising fashion in high income countries as well. This is a picture from Sarnia, Canada. Some of you may know Sarnia, but for those that don't, uh, this is where the First Nation of the Chippewas live. That's their ancestral home in the inset, in green. It's surrounded on three sides by chemical plants and oil refineries, which coincidentally are processing tar sand, some of the most polluting fossil fuels uh, coming from northern Canada. This community is incredibly close to highly polluting industries. This is the school for the community, just a stone's throw away from some of these plants where children are growing up. <clears throat> I would have to mention that Canada has consistently been ranked as one of the countries with the highest living standard in the world by various surveys. <clears throat> in addition to indigenous peoples, minorities, migrants, and other vulnerable groups are often found in this toxic divide. Among those communities, we also see those that are especially vulnerable, children, persons with disabilities, different genders, um, the disabled, among many others. This figure helps to illustrate how th these issues often intersect, social vulnerability and access to basic uh, human rights, such as access to safe drinking water. The squares in blue illustrate those communities that are socially vulnerable, and also suffer from repeated lack of access to safe drinking water here in the United States. Flint very rightly made headlines around the world, but you can see that Flint is not alone. And while Europe has been held up as having some of the best environmental standards, including on chemicals around the world, it has also found itself being exposed to having this toxic divide. Here we see migrant workers who are an invisible part of our so social fabric and also invisible to the systems that should be protecting those that are working in essential, essential fields, uh, such as those here where they are regularly exposed to pesticides. <clears throat> in, in the 
mid-1990s, the former UN Commission on Human Rights established a mandate to look at the intersection of toxics and human rights. When it created the mandate and appointed a special rapporteur, it did so with a singular focus to look at the issue of toxic waste and toxic waste being dumped from the global north on communities in the global south. This was a problem in the mid-90s and it continued up until uh, right around 2010 when this incident happened, which was uh, a ship or an incident known as the Proba Koala. For those that aren't familiar with this ship, it was uh, uh, essentially a floating factory where a company, a European company, was conducting an industrial process on board that ship because it couldn't get the permits to do that on land. When it came time to dump its waste, it found that the prices being charged by European authorities too high, so it set sail first to North Africa and then to West Africa, where it finally found someone to take its waste. That was Tommy Company in the city of Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, where under the cover of night, it took the waste and dumped it around the city of Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. 18 people died, and over 1,000 people were taken to the hospital as a result of that incident. In response, the UN Human Rights Council, as it was then formed, recognize that the issue of waste cannot be dealt with in isolation, that this is an issue that requires a life cycle approach, and it expanded the mandate on human rights and toxics to look at the entire life cycle of pollution, of chemicals and waste, hazardous substances, from the very basic raw materials throughout the life cycle up until it becomes waste. And here you can see why this is very, very important, as Leo also uh, emphasize in his rem remarks. <clears throat> the, through the years, the, uh, the work of, of several rapporteurs uh, on human rights, and, and not just on toxics and human rights, but also on safe drinking water, on adequate housing, on the right to food, and many others have clarified how many human rights are actually implicated by our exposure to toxic substances every day. Earlier, we, we spoke about overlaps, overlaps between biodiversity, climate change, and pollution. When we look at human rights, these overlaps exist as well and may even be more profound. They often intersect. They oftentimes conflict with one another. But the reality is that human rights are very much implicated by our exposures. We've made significant strides over the past 12 years I'm very happy to say in recognizing the right to a safe, clean, and healthy environment as a fundamental human right, culminating with the recognition by the UN General Assembly a few years ago of this right, as well as the International Labor Conference of the right to safe and healthy work as a fundamental principle and right. But these are both long overdue. The Stockholm Declaration recognized the right to a healthy environment in 1972, and the International Covenant recognized safe and healthy work as a fundamental right back in 1968. <clears throat> One of the challenges I see is when we look at these rights, what we don't see is what level of exposure is considered a violation of human rights. With time, what is considered safe has fallen lower and lower and lower. When we look at mercury, when we look at lead, when we look at PFAS, we see that the levels of what is considered to be safe has considerably fallen. And how these human rights will react to that reality is an open question. And meanwhile, the global trends suggest that our exposures will continue to increase. And they will increase upward, especially among the most vulnerable. Many states have conveniently turned a blind eye to the fact of this exposure and the resulting health impacts, despite the fact that their constitutions for years, if not decades, have already recognized the right to a healthy environment. 
According to the latest figures, over 12 million people will die prematurely around the world from an unhealthy environment. WHO acknowledges that this is an underestimate. We struggle to find disaggregated data, reliable disaggregated data, when it comes to vulnerable groups regarding the impacts of toxics on health. But in some cases, we do have good data. For example, if we look at the situation of workers. The latest figures from ILO and WHO show that approximately 2 million workers will die prematurely every year from exposure to toxic substances at work. So roughly in the few minutes that I've been speaking to you today, about 300 people will have lost their lives around the world prematurely from predictable and preventable toxic exposures. In parallel with the development of the right to a healthy environment and its subsequent acceptance by the international community has also been the development of a normative framework around the responsibilities of businesses to respect human rights. First codified in 2011 by Professor John Ruggie as the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, this movement has now spawned, in some cases, binding legislation in countries uh, requiring companies to respect human rights, while also articulating the framework that's based on the state's duty to protect human rights and the duty of states and the shared responsibility of businesses to ensure access to an effective remedy. When you take both the development of the right to a healthy environment and the normative framework around business and human rights, when you look at them together, what becomes very clear is that in both camps, you see an emphasis on the requirement for states to reduce the use of toxics and the responsibility of businesses to do so. I have seen this, and I, and I think others have seen this as well, including the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. If you look at their latest uh, general comment on the right to a healthy environment, you can see very clearly that they are emphasizing the state's duty to prevent and minimize exposures to the maximum extent possible, uh, especially for children. <clears throat> Now, I know that both of us have now given somewhat uh, dark projections on the future and what is happening and the state of play of the world today. Um, but I wanted to maybe turn the page a little bit to how we can help to operationalize this and perhaps to give a little sense of, of optimism for what can be done around the world to address this crisis that we're facing. <clears throat> As Robert mentioned, I work for the Toxics Use Reduction Institute in Massachusetts. And we are a creature that was created by statute back in the 80s under a piece of legislation called the Toxics Use Reduction Act. Now, this act was a byproduct of human rights abuses and violations. Uh, just outside Boston in the 70s and 80s, uh, companies were dumping their hazardous chemicals, their toxic chemicals, contaminating water supplies, which resulted in numerous cases of childhood cancers. Based on this experience, the, the state of Massachusetts, the legislature, passed the Toxics Use Reduction Act, otherwise known as TURA. Now, TURA, I think, is a, is a good example of how the state and businesses can work together to reduce the use of toxics. <clears throat> Interestingly, TURA doesn't ban or restrict any toxic chemical. It does, however, list hundreds of hazardous substances and classes of substances, including PFAS. To my knowledge, it has the broadest list or class of, of PFAS listed in legislation today around the world. Based on this list, companies are required to report their use. This use, uh, is then subject to a plan that a company must prepare every two to four years. Uh, in this plan, the companies outline what options are available for alternatives and what steps they are taking to reduce the use of the toxic chemicals on which they're reporting. Turi works with these companies to help them assess the alternatives, gives them technical support to adopt the alternatives, as well as financial support when needed. And all of this is paid for 
by the companies that are using the toxic chemicals, providing an incentive for them to make the switch to safer alternatives. <clears throat> You can see that the results have been quite profound over several decades. The Toxics Use Reduction Act was adopted in 1989. Since then, we've made significant reductions in toxics used, the volumes that are released into the environment, and the volumes that are disposed of as waste. When we zoom in on specific chemicals, we can see that the reductions have been even more profound. So in green, you can see the reductions in the use of trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene is one of the substances that was responsible for the childhood cancers that I mentioned before in Woburn, Massachusetts. Hopefully next year, we will get to zero reportable uses finally, after systemic, systematic, concerted efforts over a number of years to reduce the use, working step-by-step -step with companies and finding viable solutions and avoiding regrettable substitution along the way. <clears throat> I also wanted to give you just one example of our more recent work, however. Um, many of you are familiar with PFAS, or AKA Forever Chemicals. We were approached by a company in Massachusetts to help them develop an alternative for PFAS that's used as a surfactant in electronics. Uh, these companies uh, are clients of, of a company in Massachusetts called Transine which sells them formulations which they then use to produce microelectronics, semiconductors, and other electronics. We teamed up with researchers at the University of Massachusetts in the engineering department, and we were able to find a safer alternative within 18 months to the formulation that the company Transine was using, uh, a safer alternative that doesn't have PFAS chemicals in it. We, we identified this in 18 months the safer alternative is 90% less expensive than the PFAS formulation that the company was using. It has been adopted by 95% of their businesses over 100 clients, including some of the biggest names in electronics today. And, and all of this was accomplished by, for less than $30,000. So this is, this is one example. Uh, over thir nearly 35 years, we have thousands of other examples. And this is just our institute, our small institute in Massachusetts. Um, there are countless institutes and organizations around the world who have also developed solutions to the problems that we face today. So when I hear that our exposure today is an inevitable necessity uh, and, and unavoidable byproduct of modern society, I have to disagree. I mean, this is a political choice that we have made. We have the power to make the switch. We have the power to help realize human rights around the world, and we have the power to make sure that we can close this toxic divide to make sure that everyone can enjoy their right to a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bashkut. Um, so if I've got the number, sorry, you just, that last number blew my mind slightly, $30,000. Am I right in thinking that's like 10 to the power of five less than some of the numbers that Leo was talking about in terms of health costs of this? I mean, I've got I'm to ask the question, <laughs> but what, why, why isn't everyone doing this? What, what's holding us back? I mean, it seems like a no-brainer. It's a very good question. I mean, I think, I think the experience that, that we've had in Massachusetts shows very clearly that it's possible. Um, other people have in the past tried to replicate this model. Uh, there have been certain forces that have prevented that. So I, I believe that the reason that we're not doing this more widely is a question of political will. Thank you. <laughs>